Oh, am I excited about today's guest? She's like a soul sister with her story. Lisa Smith is a writer, a lawyer in New York City. She's the author of A Girl Walks Out of a Bar, her memoir of high-functioning addiction and recovery in the world of New York City corporate law. Her writing has been published in the Washington Post, Chicago Tribune, Women's Health, Refinery29, A Woman's Thing, AfterPartyMagazine.com, and Addiction.com. She's also appeared on Megyn Kelly Today and BBC World News, discussing alcoholism and addiction. Lisa is passionate about breaking the stigma of addiction and mental health issues. She's a graduate of Northwestern University and Rutgers School of Law, where she served on the editorial board of Rutgers Law Review. She also serves on the board of directors of the Writers' Room in New York City, where she lives with her husband, Craig. Thank you, Lisa. It is so good to be with you here. Thank you so much, Mom. I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled to be here with you. Well, you know, I, I thank you for your honesty, for being so raw and vulnerable in this book. I mean, the way you describe your journey, I get it completely. Uh, it is, well, you know what? I forgot to read a passage <laughs> on our first attempt of recording this show. I want to read this because I think it really gives people an idea of just how dark things got for you. I slid my laptop into a case. I had spent most of the weekend working on a business proposal that my law firm was submitting to a major power company. The prospective client represented millions of dollars in new business. Nonstop drinking and dozens of lines of coke had fueled my efforts from Friday evening through three o'clock Monday morning. No question that my work was better when I was high than when I was hungover. After drinking, I was a three-toed sloth. On cocaine, I was a stallion. With my bag, phone, laptop, and keys together, I looked in the mirror, checking my nose for blood and stray coke, and my teeth for smeared lipstick. Then I stepped out into the hallway and locked the door behind me. I think that describes it all, girl. <laughs> wow. It was, that was a lot of mornings, too many mornings like that. Yeah. yeah. Your journey with alcoholism started at the age of 12. Mine yes. started at 16. But share with us the issue that you had before the alcohol even kicked in. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, I was someone who... You know, I think, um, like many of us, uh, had a hard time as a kid, uh, wasn't particularly happy as a kid, and a lot of it was this feeling of not belonging, of feeling um, sad a lot, and, and a lot of fear, and a lot of feeling like I didn't fit in, people didn't like me, um, and I saw the, found out early, probably by the time I was eight, by the time I was a little kid, that the one thing that really could help me, could make those feelings go away, was food. Um, it was it was absolutely the first substance that I abused. And, you know, I was the kind of kid who would just stuff my face, not knowing that I wasn't supposed to for some reason, knowing that the way I was doing it was wrong, but being terrified and being terrified of being discovered by my mother. But... Um, just getting relief. It was that feeling of relief that, that came over me. And I had seen growing up, you know, I grew up in a house where my parents had cocktail hour every night. It was a very happy occasion. They had parties. Things looked like they got better with alcohol. It was a celebration that made people happy. I never associated negative things with alcohol use. I, my, my dad was a judge. I never... Um, saw people getting violent or yelling or fighting or a DUI or anything like that. And I just couldn't wait to grow up and to, to check it out. And I did early. I did early. And, um, you know, by the time, and, 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 you know, the first time I drank alcohol for all the wonderful things that food could bring me, alcohol was that on steroids. And, you know, by the time I was 12, I had found the kids who liked to um, drink on the weekends like to, you know, raid the parents' liquor cabinet and uh, grab what they could and we'd hang out in the woods and smoke cigarettes while we drank. 
I know the feeling of robbing the uh, the liquor cabinet. You know, we'd use Skippy peanut butter jars. But my, <laughs> my favorite fuel was Colt 45, which was a beer, malt oh, liquor. No. If I drank that fast, I was often flying. Yeah. I was great. I was cool. <laughs> I fit in. Oh, I mean, it yeah. just took away all the insecurity and all. Yeah. 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 You know, people, people often refer to it as liquid courage, mm -hmm. but to me, it felt like it was liquid indifference, right? It just like, all of a sudden, I didn't care what you thought where beforehand, all I cared about was what people thought, you know, me and feeling uncomfortable. I was just fine. It made me indifferent to the things that really um, nagged at me otherwise. So this progression went on all through high school. You get yep. into college, you're a party girl. Mm -hmm. You get into law school. And I. when did the drugs start to kind of piggyback with the alcohol? Yeah. Well, it's funny because the drugs, um, the first time I tried cocaine, I was 15. So that was very much in high school. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, cocaine was... Uh, not something that was readily accessible, except, you know, we had some friends who would bring it around sometimes. And I loved it. I thought it was great. But my first true love was, was alcohol, no question about it. And um, I, you know, it was like that in college, I could, I loved when, you know, we were able to get some coke, and we would, you know, have a great time with it. And, you know, then in law school, some and then, you know, into into practicing. And really, what happened, I used to be the kind of person who like, you could hand me your bag of Coke and say, save this for next Friday night. Like, don't use this all week, save it for next weekend. And I would be able to do that. And then over time as my drinking escalated and I became less and less able to control it. And certainly in, in a way that would allow me to go to work and function, that's where the cocaine came in. So the really heavy cocaine use came, um, in the last two years of my drinking and, you know, sort of fully charged the last 18 months where I was strictly using it to um, kind of counteract the effects of the alcohol so that I would seem, if you saw me in the morning, I would be sweating and shaking and green and I would need to drink to get out of bed in the morning. It was just a 24 seven cycle at the end. Yeah. And once I had enough drinks to calm me down a little bit, I'd recognize that I was getting a little slurry or I was a little drowsy. So then before I would leave for work, I would, you know, be using Coke to counteract that. So what looked like going out the door, what looked like <laughs> was a normal person. But in fact, it was, that was sort of the way to, um, to level set for me. That's how I could get, you know, get through my day by doing by doing that so it was not about the fun it was it was a very functional kind of thing people don't understand that we can be very high performing drunks oh gosh you know i hit it really well just like you um yeah in real estate uh my alcoholism really progressed in my 30s the way yours did mm -hmm. i don't know if that's a, a woman thing but and I married another alcoholic when I was in my early 30s. And of course, that didn't work. It was, you know, like the War of the Roses, that movie. <laughs> it was perfect. And he drank himself to death. Uh, oh, no. He died shortly after we were divorced. But I would show up and go to work. And wherever, I've always worked for myself since mm -hmm. I've been in my late 30s. But even before that, I would show up and I would function and be alert and high performing and people really find that hard to believe. And then I read your story as well. I mean, <laughs> you are a corporate lawyer and you, you've got everybody hoodwinked. Nobody's really on to you. And it, it's funny in the, um, well, first the thing you said about, about the thirties, um, someone sent me a birthday card when I was probably, I got sober when I was 38 and I think I must've been turning like 36 or something when they sent me this birthday card and they thought it was funny, I guess, but it was a, it was called the progression of the female alcoholic and it shows her sitting at the bar, like looking nice and everything at like 22. And then she's slouching a little at like 25 and then by 30, she's really slouching, and then she's hunched over, and, and at 40, she falls off the stool. 
So it was, uh, that always stuck with me, that image of that progression, if it doesn't get stopped. Yeah, I was... And, and talking about the, the ability to function, it's very, it's, it's so true. I mean, we see it around us. Um, but, you know, I practiced a lot for five and a half years. And at the beginning of that was the beginning of, you know, my, my slide. I, I began drinking every night as a first year associate. Um, but after five and a half years, and I was miserable, you know, in, in active alcoholism, we're always looking for the fix, right? And therefore, what's going to fix it? I'm going to, if only I changed this job, I'd fix it. And I switched, I stopped practicing and, but stayed at the same firm and switched into doing business development. So working actually much more directly with the partners, um, but not, I thought, you know, my hours will be better. I'll get to the gym more. I'll do all these things. I just ended up starting to drink earlier and earlier. Um, but yeah, I realized once I got sober, you know, about 10 months in was when I took kind of a next level job. So I think when we see a lot of people performing at a high level, I bet if we took the alcohol out, they, they could really go through the roof if they were actually healthy. But you, I, I know for me, at least, I sort of set in at this level where I could maintain it. Now, there was only one person in your <laughs> life early on that kind of knew oh, yeah. you were off kilt. And that was your friend, Mark, who lived in your building. Yeah. And he even yeah. said something to you once about it. And you almost pounded him into the floor. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> well, it was, I met him and, you know, I write about it in the booklet. I met him. I woke up in a drunk from a blackout. And I kicked his leg. He was in bed with me. And I was like, oh, my gosh. I turned over. I'm like, that's the cute guy from the building. What am I doing? What, what happened last night? And I was trying to remember. And, um, and for some reason, he stuck around. I don't know what was wrong with him. Um, but, you know, I, it was really towards the end of my using. And um, so he actually saw a lot more than anybody else could have seen because I was very good at protecting, you know, the outer picture from my friends, from my family. But, you know, he was around at odd hours and he did. He confronted me. He said, listen, you know, I think you're cross addicted. You have to go to rehab. You're, um, you know, you're an alcoholic and, and a drug addict. And if you don't do this, you know, I'm, I'm not going to stick around and watch you die. And I said, great, there's the door. Please go. Like, I don't, you know, but then it was really about two weeks after that, that the morning happened where I just felt I couldn't, I was overwhelmed. I thought I was having a heart attack and now know I was having an anxiety attack. And I realized, I just said in that moment, I guess all along I had thought, you know, it's okay if I die, there's nothing really to live for. Um, but in that moment when it was really in front of me, something said, you know, I want to live. I don't want to die. And I went back into the apartment and he was the person I called and said, I need help. And he came right upstairs. Is that the morning you went in over to the detox at, was it Grace Stevens Hospital? Square, yeah. 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 That was the, the, the beginning. So you, you woke up it's like I did. I didn't have one more day in me, Lisa. I yeah. Yes, yes. It was, it was this feeling that said, Mal, you cannot do this one more day or yeah. you're going to be dead that's exactly how i felt that's exactly how i felt and i think that's why we've been knock on wood fortunate not to have relapses because mm -hmm. when i would when i went in it wasn't because somebody was telling me i had to go it wasn't because i had gotten fired or gotten arrested or something like that it was because i was that day i felt like well and truly done i cannot do this and, you know, we call it the gift of desperation. That, God, you know, yes. Tell me what to do and I'll do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had a neighbor like you did. Um, and his name was George. And he used to say to me, Mal, I'm keeping a seat warm for you. Oh, oh you had at a meeting. And I'd say, George, you can take that seat. And you know where you can put it. I mean, as much resistance to the oh, fact boy. that yeah. I had a drinking problem. Yeah. But that final day, I said, I'm a drunk yeah, and I need help. And if I don't take a step today in the right direction, I'm going to be dead yeah. probably within yeah. a couple of days. Because I, I really felt very suicidal yeah. uh, the, that, yeah. that last day or two. I was like, I'm just going to do myself in because I can't yeah. do it anymore. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. I felt, 
I was so sick. I was throwing up blood. I was oh. like, you know, I, I was, my skin was like, you know, an unripe banana. It was just, I bruised so easily and it was bad. It was, it was very bad. Yeah. So it was probably your liver really starting to kick in and, and give you some warning signs. Thank goodness it can get better when we stop drinking. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> uh, I just love your whole description of going into detox and refusing to stay on that floor and <laughs> demanding that you go to another floor. Uh, I, the whole scene is, is really just <laughs> so descriptive. So give us... A, Give us a, a little bit of the, the, the flavor of your resistance once you got there. Oh, yeah. Well, when I, when I checked in, you know, I didn't know. I didn't, uh, I didn't have a George. I had no idea. I didn't know anybody in, um, in recovery. And I knew that I was sick enough that I needed a medicated detox, um, <laughs> that I would have to check in somewhere. And I called my doctor. He was like, oh, you're fine. I just saw you a few months ago. All your blood work is fine. And I told him, I was like, I get up in the morning and drink. I do, you know, whatever. And he was like, okay, you, you should go inpatient. You should go today. So he looked, we looked in the, um, in the insurance, the book of my insurance, uh, where I could go, where I'd be covered. And it was, there was a place in Hell's Kitchen, which I was like, no, no, I won't go to Hell's Kitchen, right? I was very fancy at that point. Um, and meanwhile, now I live in Hell's Kitchen. And, uh, and there was this place, Gracie Square, and it was on the Upper East Side. And I was like, Gracie Square, Upper East Side, how bad can that be, right? I'll go there. Um, which I found out later is known as the rats, the rat's nest of New York City public mental hospital. Oh, and in, in order to be treated, I had to sign in on a three-day psych hold. I had to agree to a 72-hour psych hold before they would take me in, and I did. And... Um, let's just say, don't ask your gastroenterologist where to go to detox. He doesn't know. Um, it was, the, it was terrible from the moment the um, elevator doors opened up and I saw, you know, women fighting and screaming at each other. And, and then I was just, that's when it, it really hit me because the door behind me on the lockdown site board had slammed shut. And I was like, what have I done? <laughs> and I was sobering up and I was feeling sick. And, um, and then this, this man was coming down the hall. It was a co-ed floor, detox floor with no locks on any doors. And, you know, you had a roommate and you would share a bathroom down the hall or something. And um, this guy just walked by me and said, you know, and was like, I'm going to mess you up. Like you. And I was like, that's it. I'm out. I want it out immediately. I'm done. I'm not doing this. This is, I, you know, I felt like I do not feel safe. And I thought, as a lawyer, somehow I could argue my way out of it. No, but no, not so fast. So, um, so I ended up staying there, and they accommodated me. They accommodated me by um, letting me go. They had a they had another floor there that was actually and it's still there. It's still on their website. You can see it. Um, that's devoted solely to um, Asian patients, not lockdown or I'm sorry, not uh, detox, but just any kind of mental health issues. And um, they said, it'll be quieter up there. It won't be like that. Um, well, you, we can put you up there if you want. And uh, I, yeah, I wouldn't let them draw blood from me. I wouldn't let them. I wouldn't take any drugs from them that first night. Like, no way. But I did end up staying. Yeah. Oh, and the description of, of what your body went through those first couple of days. Oh, girl, that was tough. And, you know, uh, the vomiting, the pain. Uh, Oh yeah, yeah. everything. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And I then smacked my head on a bed of nails. Like it was pain. That's what made, finally made me say, "Fine, give me, take the blood, give me the Librium," because I'm so sick after I hadn't had a drink in like you know many hours. And I love when your friends come and they're all like, "Where are you?" I mean, this isn't a detox. What is this? Oh yeah, my family did that. <laughs> Family. My family were like my my parents and my brother. I have a younger brother who's two years younger than me, and I don't know how they moved around so freely in this lockdown mental hospital, but they did. And they were, you know, my mom was like, "We're getting you out of here. This place is scuzzy. This is, you know, you, if you really feel like you need to do this, we will get you somewhere better." And at that point, I had just, you know, allowed them to take the blood, and I had just taken the librium, and I finally felt like I was sleep. I could. But, you know, I'd fallen asleep and 
I was, I said, nah, you know what, I don't want to start this again. Let me just, I'll just stay here. And they agreed to let me stay in that room. And, um, and yeah, so, but and yeah, you, my friends came to visit and they were like, what is going yeah. on? Yeah. yeah. You were there what a week, one week, five days, five days. And then you get out, but your biggest concern is not your sobriety. Your biggest concern is getting back to your office. Yeah. Yeah. That, about how do I explain to, you know, my big important boss where I've been and what's going on. Uh, yeah. The first thing, you know, it was, it was interesting when I made the decision that morning that I was going to go and I called my doctor and we decided where to go. And I called Gracie square and they said I could come anytime until 11 o'clock that night. Um, I, the first thing I did was email my office cause it was early. It was, you know, in the morning and I knew nobody would be there yet. And I sent an email and said, listen, I'm really sorry, but I had a medical emergency over the weekend. I'm going to have to be in the hospital this week, but don't worry about me. I'm fine. You know, uh, I'm going to be out of touch, but I will see you next Monday because I knew that under the privacy laws, um, I could be out sick for five days and not have to explain anything. But if I was going to be out a sixth day, I would need to have a note from my doctor or something uh -huh. to explain why I was still sick. So whatever was going to happen to me, I was going to be back in that office on that day because I was not going to tell them, you know, what had happened or where I had been. So How long did it take for you to let them know what your story was? I never did. You never did. I went right back that next week. I do not recommend this. It is not uh, the way to do it at all. And it's part of, it's a huge part of why I feel like it's so important for me to try and speak up about this stuff and try and break the stigma mm -hmm. because I want the next person in that position to go, you know, like on the fourth day, um, a social worker came in to my room and was like, she had these brochures. Here's where you can go for 30 days. Here's where you can go for 28 days. And I looked at her, I was like, do I have to go? somewhere now and she said no no but it's you know it's strongly recommended and then I was like nope not going yeah. and we finally settled on a plan where um I went to outpatient intensive outpatient rehab two nights a week after work and I started going to 12-step meetings at that point and you know just I'm, I'm so grateful that I managed you know not so far 14 years later not, not to have had um a relapse but uh yeah, I, I, I was terrified of telling them. I, I felt so much shame around it. And, you know, in law firms, it's very much, as I know it is in real estate, right? Work hard, play hard, drinking culture. Um, and, you know, you can't, you know, they, they prize stamina and strength. And, you know, um, I was terrified that all of a sudden I would go from, you know, on Friday having been seen as this, you know, competent, reliable, smart member of the team to being seen as someone who was you know, defective or couldn't be trusted or weak. And I, I just wasn't going to let that happen. I had never seen anybody go out on a leave that, you know, if you have broke a leg or if you had some sort of, you know, bad diagnosis, people are out on medical leaves all the time. And if you have a baby, you know, you are out in, in my law firm, you're out for six months. Oh. Um, but yeah, but you know, I've never seen somebody say, you know, I'm really, I've got to go address a substance abuse issue, or I've got to go, you know, I, I have depression in my family, and I feel like I need to go treat it, and I'm not, you know, I, I think we are beginning to see some of that, which is such a huge step, um, but not then, I went right back. I love the description the day you went back to your office, and <laughs> talk about the yellow sticky. Oh my everywhere god. Everywhere because your 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 memory had been failing you and this was your only coping mechanism was to have stickies everywhere reminding you what you needed yeah. to do or said or whatever. It was hysterical in the book. <laughs> it looked like really my office when I went back looked like a crime scene. I couldn't <laughs> believe like what happened. I and you know it's funny because the culture of law firms, um, you know, a lot of lawyers have terribly messy offices. And no one thinks they have a substance abuse problem. Mm -hmm. You know, whereas if someone had been maintaining an office like mine or like some other lawyers at any firm, there was nothing specific about the firms I was at that contributed to, you know, sort of my decline. Um, it was, it could have been any firm. 
but um, you know, nobody thinks, oh, there's there's really something, there must be something wrong with that person. In a corporation, I'm guessing somebody would come down the hall and say, what's happening here? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that look right. Uh, oh. Yeah. And today you have 14 years of sobriety. Yeah. You're traveling all of the all over the US speaking. You were down at I think uh Georgetown University just a couple of weeks ago. You were in DC yeah. speaking. Yeah, yeah, Georgetown Law. Yeah. That was uh, yeah, that was a big conference of real estate lawyers. I've I've been really fortunate. I've been able to go um around the country to law firms. I do a lot of speaking at law firms and uh conferences like that, CLE conferences where you know, bar associations will get together. Um, a lot of um, now law schools and and other uh, other groups. It's great. It's you know there was it's very interesting. There was a study that came out about three months before my book came out. My book came out in June of 2016. This study came out about three months earlier, finding that lawyers, practicing employed lawyers, have a rate of substance abuse and mental health disorders twice more than twice the general population. And from that, a task force was formed through the American Bar Association, and there are all these um, recommendations now on what employers of lawyers, law schools, et cetera, should be doing to, uh, to do better by lawyer mental health and substance abuse. And under the, um, under the realization that you can't be a good lawyer unless you're a healthy lawyer, and uh, so it's been it's been great because I've been able to speak to that topic. And the response to you sharing your story and just you know how bad things got, how do they react to you? Um, it's been I mean not come on, it's been great. Um, I really feel like uh, you know it, it is sort of getting a message through. You know I. I, so I never, when I went back to work right after I got sober, I didn't tell my law firm, you know, what had happened. I just went back to work, you know, and people would be like, when I got back, they were like, oh, you look so much better. I'm so glad you, <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm a, a lot better. I'm physically detox. Um, and then I, you know, I was doing my job. And then about 10 months later, I got a call from a recruiter for kind of a next level job at another firm. A, a job I couldn't have interviewed for, you know, before they, I, I never would have been able to. And then I left the firm and came to the new firm, which I'm still at now, 13 years later. And, um, you know, so when the book was coming out, so when I got the book contract in September, 2014, I had to tell the firm, like, I, I cause I really didn't discuss it. Certainly wasn't open about it at work. And, um, I did, uh, you know, some people that I was close to knew my story, but but most did not. But people didn't know, know that I was writing. See, what happened, the way the book came about was when I got home from that, those five days of the detox, um, they were so, and the reason you say that they were, you know, kind of vividly um, expressed is because I, I started writing that as soon as I got out. I, I that's when I began, I was like, what, a, this is, you know, I can't even believe what just happened. For some reason, I felt like it needed to be memorialized. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, I was waking up in the mornings, not drinking, so excited because I w hadn't had a drink the day before. Every day was a miracle. It still is. And um, I had this energy. Plus, I would drink about a pot of coffee because I could. Um, and that's how I wrote the book at like five in the morning. I was a 5 a.m. writer for 10 years. Wow. And the first thing I wrote was that those five days in the hospital. And in part because my friends and family were like, what happened? Why didn't you tell us? How could we not know? You know, why didn't you ask for, and some people were angry and confused. And I was telling the story over and over. And finally I could just be like, here, and hand them a bunch of pages, you know? Um, so it became, through that process, I was really writing it to sort of explain things to family and friends. And I realized I was sort of explaining things to myself. And I found the writing really cathartic and really helped me put pieces together, you know, because really what I discovered through the process was that, um, you know, I had been self-medicating, which they had said to me in the, in the detox, the, the psychiatrist who had met with me uh, over the course of those five days said, you know, you're a smart woman with a very serious problem. And if you don't stop drinking, you're going to die. And he said, I think you've been self-medicating 
uh, an undiagnosed uh, major depressive disorder that you, you, you know, were, were not aware you were dealing with, but the way you found comfort from it was in food and then alcohol and drugs. And you're going to stop treating it that way. And you're going to start treating it appropriately with antidepressants. And that's, you know, that's what we're going to do. And I remember it being such a relief to hear that, to be like, oh, that's what it is. You know, it being this thing that always loomed, this kind of hanging anxiety and sadness. And, you know, there was a name for it and there was something I could take for it. And it gave me a lot of hope. So, um, yeah. And I think a lot of women who do abuse alcohol, including myself, battled depression. Yeah. It wasn't really diagnosed and therefore right. wasn't treated until right. I got sober and then it was yeah. dealt with. Yeah. Um, now, how are you today as far as depression? Do you, do, you st- do you still take medication for it? Yeah. You do? Yeah, I did about a year and a half into sobriety, you know, because I went on the antidepressants right away. About a year and a half into sobriety, I said to my therapist who I was saying, you know, I'm not sure what part of sobriety is just or feeling better. is just sobriety and what part is the antidepressants? And I'd like to try to go off them just to see if I can. Um, how I do. And she said, okay, we can do that. We can do that experiment. And I did. I did a very slow over a period of months, taper down. I was on Lexpro, taper down, and then took my last pill. And I was feeling good and I felt just fine. And then three weeks later, like the lights went out, out, like just, it was like a black screen got pulled over my eyeballs. And I was, I couldn't get out of bed. I would manage, it was like, okay, I would, first of all, I would be like, oh, why get out of bed? Why am I here? I hate life. You know, that sort of feeling. And I'd be like, all right, just put one foot on the ground. And then I would just put the other foot on the ground. All right, let's go brush teeth. And I would be like lumbering. Like the first symptom for me of a depression relapse is this exhaustion. And, you know, I I tried to see if it would get better. And um, my sponsor in recovery was like, this is life on life's terms. You know, you're just feeling your feelings and all that. And I would get into the office, shut the door. I couldn't take any personal phone calls because I would start crying. And just all day, it would just be running down my face for no reason. And I had to go on a work trip to Florida, I remember. And this one morning, I just rolled out of the bed onto the floor and I called my therapist and I said, I have four days before I drank. I don't know why it's four days. I don't know what's going on, but I know that I can feel this way for four more days and then I'm going to drink. And she said, experiment's over, get back home. You're going immediately back on it. And I haven't tried to go off again. I still have relapses, depression relapses, because I think my dosage is something that is, you know, works really well for me, but not numbing me out and not, you know, I feel all my feelings and, you know, that opens me up to the potential of having depression relapses. But now I know what they are and, you know, I have tools to work through them and, you know, generally they pass after a few days. And if they don't, I have to start talking to my doctor and see if I need to adjust something. Well, Lisa, I, I appreciate your honesty (laughs) You are putting a new face out there for women in recovery, (laughs) which is so important. This book was just outstanding. Girl Walks Out of a Bar. I love it. And how can the audience, if anybody wanted to reach out to you, give us your Facebook page, your website, whatever you prefer. My website is um, www.lisasmithauthor.com. And you, anybody, I, and it's on my website too, but you can always email me directly. I, I answer all my emails at uh, girlwalksout at gmail.com. I'm on Twitter and Instagram at girlwalksout. And I'm also, I'm a little harder to find on Facebook. I'm on Facebook. Um, but maybe if they go to you, they'll find me because it's hard to find Elisa Smith, but you and I are Facebook friends. Right. So we can't, they can uh, find through you or, you know, but just putting in Lisa Smith, girl walks out of a bar. Well, thank you again for your time. I know how busy you are. Oh, but please. You're, you're delivering perfect. such a, a powerful message for women out there. And I just truly appreciate oh, it. Oh, wow. uh, what you're doing is incredible. And I appreciate you for all, all the hard work you do getting 
you know, your message out and other people's messages out. There's just no better work. Thank you. Thank Have you. Have a great day. You too. Bye.